lectures under Kenneth Errol. Kenneth Errol he is an outstanding economist, as you all know, but he played a very special role for the Institute for Fund Study. In 1990, he established the schools of economy. This is part of a cluster which contains five schools, but he was, in a way, the most dedicated director. He kept for 18 years directing the schools, which is something outstanding, and we are forever grateful for him. And this gratefulness we have tried to express in the, I think, the Arrow Lectures. Now, I would also uh, like to thank Eric Maskin, Professor Eric Maskin, for stepping in and for creating for us and continuing the tradition of these highly attractive and stimulating schools. I would like also to note Professor William Pittsburgh, who has contributed the money uh, which, was, which made this series of eight possible. And I would like to thank Professor Michael Shishinsky for making the connection which enabled uh, uh, this to go. And of course, I'd like to thank Professor Holmstrom for the lecture. And let's call upon Eric Maskin. So that I, I wanted to welcome you to, to the Yara Lecture, uh, which is, in some sense, the, the focal point of the summer school. Uh, as Eliezer said, uh, Ken Arrow can be recognized for, for many things that he's done, but this particular lecture series uh, was set up to Mark his contributions to the summer school, and, and there were there were basically two requirements that the lecture take place uh, during the summer school, and, and it is uh, the summer school uh, went on all last week, or including tomorrow. Uh, but the other requirement is that it be delivered by a uh, an economist of international renown, and he have, uh, I think he would have certainly succeeded there. Uh, uh, ben Holmstrom uh, is, by any standard, uh, a uh, leading uh, economist in the world today. Uh, he's the Paul Sanderson Professor of Economics at MIT. For MIT, he taught at Yale and Northwestern. He became famous at an early age uh, for his major contributions to the theory of moral hazard, uh, which is uh, how you get someone uh, to act on your behalf when his interests uh, are not aligned with yours. Uh, but since then, he's gone on to make important contributions to many other areas of economic theory, the theory of the firm, the concept of liquidity, uh, and especially relevant for today's lecture, uh, our understanding of financial crisis. So uh, please welcome a great economist uh, and someone who's also an old personal friend of mine, Ben Thompson. Thank you, Eric, and uh, uh, I'm, re I'm really deeply honored to be here. Uh, it's a double pleasure in the sense that uh, Ken Arrow has played in my life, intellectual life, a huge role. I studied at Stanford. Ken was there every summer, at least at the famous uh, IMSSS, at the time when I think uh, theory has, uh, was at almost its most exciting, at least that's the way uh, the music sounds to me at this age. And, uh, and of course, uh, because of Eric, who uh, is a long-time personal friend and also was part of the I'm a Triple S, I learned to know Eric at that time. So we go Arrow, Maskin, and a number of others, Yari, you know, and many, Eitan Szynski and so on, are all part of this, uh, this uh, wonderful set of memories that uh, I, at least, I, I have from uh, Stanford, I'm sure you, many of you share. So it is really, really a pleasure to be here. So thank you, Eric, for 
inviting me. I want to speak today uh, about uh, the financial crisis. Uh, this is a general lecture. Uh, there is some uh, modeling behind it. Uh, uh, some more successful, some less successful. Uh, I chose uh, to speak uh, this way in a general terms and in trying to be somewhat provocative with the, with the title at least, uh, considering what uh, Bob Bauman said uh, uh, just a while ago. Uh, this title was not selected after he spoke. It was before I, I said that why ignorance is uh, bliss is basically the storyline uh, or the central part of the story I put in almost there just to appease uh, some, uh, actually it is an important qualification. And I will come to that. But it is a perspective that uh, uh, I hope is suitably, suitably uh, provocative in the sense that it, it is not a natural way that people think of it. I've given this talk in, in other variant, variations before, and, and typically the reaction is one where, where people do not feel, uh, feel this type is ignor ignorance is bliss uh, may sound uh, like uh, just the opposite of what everybody else thinks right now. Uh, so uh, let me go on and put down the storyline as I will tell it. I want to give sort of the main storyline and then I go get into some of the details of the storyline, which are of course important. Uh, but I will uh, refrain from any mathematical expressions here. So uh, the storyline. This is taken from Gary Gorton's uh, studies of, of banking. Gorton is a co-author of mine. So we talk a lot about these things and some of this, uh, his thinking has influenced me and, and, and conversely. Uh, it is a picture of the, what he calls the quiet period, 70 years without a banking panic. And those who were um, here in the morning, uh, or I'm sorry, in the panel uh, may, may remember that there was a, Eric commented immediately, uh, there hasn't been 60 years or 70 years or whatever it is. There has been crisis. Here you see the s and L crisis, savings and loan crisis. But uh, the picture really suggests that there is, since the Great Depression, which has uh, 4,000 banking failures and was a wide systemic, uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, event, there has been really nothing going on much. And that includes, and it's not that the SNL crisis was irrelevant, but it was just that it never even threatened to the banking system itself. As I said uh, at lunchtime, the biggest threat to the banking system probably was uh, the long-term capital management crisis. Even the dot-com boom didn't have a ripple almost on the bank. It was completely within the, in, within the system of... Uh, of uh, uh, equity markets or the Nasdaq market mainly, but it spread also in other markets. Uh, but uh, it never affected really any banks or uh, at least to my knowledge. As you can see, the, this vertical axis here is the number of banks uh, and there is not much happening here. Uh, there was the famous Penn Central uh, bankruptcy. There are of course a number, it, it looks like zero, but every year there are banks failing here in the tens or so, you know, so it's not a big event if a small bank fails, but if a big bank like Bank Central fails, uh, that creates a little bit of nervousness. In contrast to this quiet period here, it should be noticed that the period before, you go back to the start with, say, 1850s, 1840s, free banking, national banking area, all the way past when actually the Federal Reserve was created in, in uh, 1916 or 18 or something like that, or was it earlier, somewhere here in this period, there was a continuing crisis about uh, a little more frequently than one every 10 years. A panic in the sense that, you know, currency, there was a currency famine and there, there was uh, fairly serious effects, real effects, and so on, and this kept repeating itself. Uh, Typically, it was self-contained in the sense that clearing houses, as they were called at the time, were private institutions that dealt with this financial crisis, and they were often also localized uh, because, you know, there wasn't that much trade, so they didn't spread around the, all of the U.S., but they stayed in the New York region or, you know, Philadelphia region, or you name it, they were localized in that sense. But 
Nevertheless, for the time, there were significant crises. So uh, there is a, this line is extremely sharp. And if one, uh, one has to ask why, why is this quiet period suddenly coming, and uh, everybody would agree it is because uh, of two things. One, was, uh, one we know for, so, for sure is deposit insurance. It didn't come with the Fed because Fed, as I said, was created here. And then came this huge, enormous crisis. It's conceivable, by the way, in my mind, that this Great Depression was a consequence of the creation of the Fed. And I'll come back possibly at the very end to explain what I mean by that. I see certain parallels with the Fed being created and this happening, this catastrophe happening. I see certain parallels to that and the European uh, crisis right now. Because when the Fed was created, it did not put in deposit insurance. So deposit insurance came only after the, the crisis, or, or in, during the crisis here in 1934, and that eventually cured, it is certainly a substantial part of why this doesn't happen, hasn't happened. So much so that people basically didn't think it would ever happen. Deposit insurance had taken care of everything. And uh, the other part that may be relevant, and Ethan mentioned it at lunch, was uh, Glass-Steagall, which pe people sort of poo-poo a lot, but I happen to think Glass-Steagall was pretty important. And uh, even though it was uh, terminated at the time when it didn't seem to have much of an effect anymore. But the, now, of course, we have a crisis. In, uh, in, I don't know how many banks have gone, it's not on this diagram, how many banks have gone, uh, gone belly up, uh, but uh, the numbers are higher. But above all, this was a financial crisis in a different part of the system initially, which is the shadow banking system. So when one asks why the crisis now, uh, I think most of us think that it's got to have something to do, and uh, not just with the subprime, but with the whole creation of the shadow, pricing, uh, shadow banking system, or rather the enormous growth in the shadow banking system. So that's got to be part of the story. And the why the US, I will also come back to that. That's a very important question. Why did it start in the, in the country that's thought to have the most stable and most secure system of all? So these are important and remarkable questions because of course we have a lot of crises around the world, but not in the US. So the common view of the course is, uh, this is somewhat of a straw man, but I think it's widely held. Uh, a common reason is seen to be, you know, Wall Street had bad incentives, was greedy. Uh, the invention of the originate and distribute model, securitization, complex, opaque, asset-backed asset -backed securities. These are some of the central elements in people's thinking about why the crisis took place. Starting, of course, with the subprime itself that was uh, of, uh, of quest most questionable quality, those loans. Uh, two questions that, uh, that uh, among many that have been asked that I want to focus on as a lead up to my, uh, to my uh, talk is, uh, People ask, how could people trade without knowing much of anything regarding the, what was inside these complex opaque asset-backed securities, for instance? So this was a question that uh, when I attended Jackson Hole in 2008, where this whole line of research started for me, uh, commenting on Gorton's paper, uh, several distinguished uh, economists, and I don't want to mention their names, uh, uh, but felt very passionate about the fact that the problem has to do with this opaqueness. And they really questioned this, how, how stupid Wall Street can be, or how corrupt Wall Street can be, or what, what kind of conspiracy there must have been, or, you know, whatever they, they, they had, they sort of, kept talking about various possible hypotheses of what, what was so wrong with Wall Street, but crazy they were in one way or another. I don't know how many have read the book uh, by Michael Lewis called The Big Short. Is that a familiar book here? It's an entertaining book. But the, basically the whole line of the book is saying, you know, nobody knew pretty much anything on Wall Street. And that was the shocking. Only five people in the book really understood what was going on. 
Now, a social scientist who hear that five people were the only ones who knew what was going on, and you know, there are 10,000 people that were idiots and stupid. Somehow you don't build your, your theory or your explanation or something immediately at least on the hypothesis that there were only five smart people around or, or, or people who had some sense. It's conceivable that 10,000 people can be wrong and five right. But on the whole, at least, you know, this question about why, why people didn't know much or didn't ask many questions needs a deeper answer than that they were stupid. And so that's what I'm partly providing, trying to tell. And the, my telling is that this was exactly the way it was supposed to be. That's the main theory. That's the ignorance is bliss story. So quite opposite to all the talk about people being scandalized by by these uh, experts and investment bankers and so on, not knowing very much. My assertion is that uh, I'm not saying they exactly should have been as ignorant as they were, but on the whole, it's natural to understand why they were so ignorant. Another way of putting it is liquidity, the story is going to be about liquidity essentially being about ignorance, or, ra or put in this time is not asking any questions. And uh, so another story they often tag on is uh, this, uh, this is one of many other quotes. Why were they relying, for instance, on mechanical ratings? So rating agents get beaten up by this public and, by the way, economists. Because as it has been found, everybody relied on the so-called Lee formula in pricing these asset-backed securities. And now, they, now when the crisis came and people started studying more closely the Lee formula, it was fo found to be very naive regarding correlations and so, for, so on and so forth. All sorts of problems with it. How, how did we go along with this completely inadequate formula to price these risks? And uh, that's also something that I will assert is a natural outcome of this uh, theory of liquidity that I'm going to present or hypothesis of liquidity. Let me emphasize, these are not proven points, but I'm happy to take answers and, uh, questions and, and try to answer. I've done more work about trying to back up the theory than, uh, than these slides really present. So the remedies are never again make it panic proof, make it transparent. This is going to be one of the critical questions. And let me say here right away, I am not arguing that it shouldn't be more transparent. Just to make clear that I'm not saying that the system being as non-transparent as it is, is an ideal state of nature. What I'm saying is that when private parties trade the way they were trading without regulation about it, not lack of transparency was a very natural outcome. And, uh, and so we'll get to the question of transparency having to be produced by somebody else or having to be regulated in some manner. But it still costs, it's extremely important, and it makes a huge difference if you regulate transparency out of the view that you think people are stupid or idiot or corrupt or something like that, versus this is a very essential part of a system of liquidity, that it's not transparent when people do. And therefore, regulating transparency has to be carried out with the, with the right mindset regarding what is natural in the system of non-transparency or opaqueness. Uh, too big to fail, I have comments. I, I, I think this is a potentially disastrous way of thinking about the problem. Uh, I mean, let me just say, I, the part of this is, I think, I think we are right now in the regulatory arena, people are extraordinarily naive in my view about many of the features of uh, this crisis. Namely, they haven't even tried to explain why things work so well before this crisis, which is the obvious question. They come up with conclusions that are, in my view, more or less knee-jerk reactions to a panic, and, uh, and that may be okay for initial regulation, but you know, eventually we need to dig deeper than this. Titan leverage is, uh, is a good one. I'm going to be in agreement with that, uh, and then we'll talk about some other things. So here is the storyline sort of just summarized and I go into some of the details. It's pieced together from some of the stories that other economists have told. So one of, it's, uh, this is about global in, imbalances. That in, in the emerging markets in particular, 
a lot of, there was a lot of excess liquidity, a lot of income, retained earnings, that was looking for parking place. So why didn't they park the money, say, if it came from China, which is our sort of lead example, why wouldn't they park it in China? The answer is that, one answer is that, you know, they didn't have good enough investment opportunities or they didn't have good enough investment opportunities relative to the kind of financial system that was play, in place at the time. So uh, people, I think that is only one part of the story. And I don't want to go into the other part because the other part is how did they have so much excess funds? And there people just say, well, they saved a lot. But actually, I think it's very important to understand that China, the way production in this global economy has taken place, multinational companies, especially, say, in China, and this comes from my experience with Nokia, is that uh, it's very unusual. From the very beginning, you put a factory into China, the Chinese are making money. They have a positive cash flow from day one. They are basically renting their labor to multinationals. And they are charging for the labor partly by holding a stake in the company and, of course, partly by getting the income from you know, the workers earning money. They never borrow to buy a machine from America and then say, you know, try to work this machine by themselves. That's never is a little exaggerated. But you understand that's a much slower process. And it's a process that first will create current account deficits. And then eventually you may be able to pay back. And most growing countries are always in a more or less a continuous current account deficit. Sort of, and you know, as soon as they get into balance, they will again become indebted. Finland being a good example, but so you can point to a lot. This part of the story hasn't been told. I think it's a very important part of the story. This is why people say money is flowing the wrong way. You know, people, economists were very puzzled by the fact that how is it that you know, emerging markets where people should, we should be investing, you know, actually they are paying us and you know, they are parking their money in us and not the other way around. And as I said, this is at least part of the story. Uh, so uh, that's, that's an important ingredient. The, the other question is why did they park most of the money in the U.S.? They could have parked it in Europe, they could have parked it in a lot of other places that are, if, if the issue is just safety and good legal structure and so on, U.S. is not unique. They could have parked in Canada, they could have parked in anywhere. Here is my part of, uh, this is one that I don't have necessarily very much agreement on, but I, I feel very convinced that it's got to have to do with the fact that the U.S. had an advance in place securitization technology already. That is, they had a shadow banking system. It was small, or relatively speaking small, but it had been in place in some form, you know, since the 50s. In fact, it was started by the government. You know, the idea of putting assets in a bag and selling them off. Trancing is a newer invention, but uh, the basic infrastructure was there. And therefore, and my assertion is that in traditional banking, we could never have been able to absorb those amounts of funds. They would have had to go into you know, equity markets or somewhere else, but they would not have been absorbed in the, in the banking system in, in safe securities. And to the extent these foreigners searched, looked for safe investments. Why is a big question, by the way. This enormous demand for safe securities. But to the extent they did, the U.S. was a very natural place because it could welcome it. I mean, it's possible also that, uh, that the U.S. are people who actually are always eager to spend more than they earn. You know, that's, that's part of the story. Very willing to run current account imbalances. But actually, when you look at the way interest rates behave and so on, a story about money pushing its way into the U.S. as opposed to the U.S. asking for more money all the time in order to satiate their demand, uh, this, uh, this former story is a more probable one. So uh, that's, uh, and, f and then a very important part of the story is going to be that this transparency, this lack of transparency or low transparency is a very key ingredient in enhancing the liquidity of the market in this, uh, both in the shadow banking system as any banking system. And the, we get to the undoing about how, how it happened. So I just put down the saving glass. It just shows you that the U.S. really runs uh, a, a current account. It, it most, this picture just shows that most of it went to the U.S. You know, this is the rest of the world, and this is uh, U.K., 
and then you see the most of it went to, you know, the imbalance was really picked up by the U.S. So that's a big question to answer. Uh, and I, have never, I, I haven't seen any alternative answers. So let me say, uh, uh, say a little bit about the parking space. You know, that's my language for parking money. If you have money and you want to save it for, you don't want to consume it now, you want to consume it tomorrow, you need to find, you have a problem. You need to find a place to park it. And that problem is a very, of course, uh, central throughout this crisis. And it continues to be. Anybody who has, as I said in my class earlier, a million or 10 million or, or, or a billion or something like that, thinks a lot. Not so much even about, you know, how do I get a good return? Just, you know, how do I, may I make sure that the money that I have now is actually available tomorrow? It has become an acute issue where you put it in a safe place. And uh, under the pillow is not a good place, uh, for that amount at least. So uh, there are ways to create parking places uh, and this list is of importance. One, first of all, housing is a natural place because housing is an enormously large asset. Housing is also a slow-moving asset in the sense of slow-moving price. For, and, and so it's not a surprise that most crises actually appear in real estate. Be exactly because it is a, not a highly volatile, uh, you know, prices don't go up and down 5% in housing. They go up and up 5% over the period of a year or something like that. But, but uh, they, they are sort of big, slow waves that they come in so they can be troublesome, and, uh, but uh, housing is a natural place. Uh, one, one way to you know, create parking space for the U.S. is to create, build more real estate. And this happened in commercial real estate a fair amount, but on the whole, actually, Unlike what uh, Bob Bauman said, actually this is a fairly small part of the story, the new building of housing. You know, you can't build that fast, it's the short of it. So uh, it's, uh, I have some numbers, you know, but uh, it, it's modest. It's about 15% on a six-year basis, you know. Six years, normal years would be 15% or 20% lower than it actually was, you know, the critical years I'm talking about. So this is not a huge increase in the activity of real estate. If you add the commercial one, it's a little higher. The big, one of the big actors is home equity loans, where the parking goes so that the Chinese who wants to park, you know, $100,000, and he sees that uh, I have, I'm figuratively speaking now, he sees that I have a home where I have paid off the whole house, and the house is worth a million dollars, say, just to take a round number. This is a wonderful empty parking space for the Chinese. You know, the Chinese are drooling and looking. This is a safe place, you know, a million dollars, and there's no money invested in it. And so for me to take a home equity loan, uh, I'm benefiting the Chinese who is allowed to actually park the money there. This kind of mindset, this is a little allegorical story. It doesn't happen this way. But you understand the value of actually taking out a loan is that you allow somebody else to park his, his, his or her money in it. And so home equity loan indeed grew enormously because the way somebody actually got attracted me to this deal was to say, why don't you take a home equity loan, you know, 2% or 3%. Let me tell you, the phone rang every week. Eric probably can also tell if you had, you know, every week you got phone calls, don't you want to take a home equity loan? So Wall Street was actively seeking for people who had, you know, space in their home for, you know, parking, uh, emerging market money or whatever money it is. This is, uh, you'll see later a figure to see that this was actually a huge part of the story. Uh, a second part, it's very much relates to this field, and, and I'm emphasizing also here, is uh, people think the shadow banking system was as a whole some kind of a scam. And you know, it was some idea of you know, some game or Ponzi scheme whereby people were playing you know, uh, games with Un, with, with the money of uh, more naive people. And the answer is, when you look at the originate and distribute model and the repo market and so on, it allows a much more efficient use of collateral because once this collateral, this, this value of the house is out there on the market, it can be, you know, it's basically like a, it could be an arrow de brew type market. So it gets allocated and reallocated all the time. So when we come later into these figures, you'll see that 
there is enormous activity, huge volume in the so-called repo market, which I'll explain what it is. In the, and, and it may look like it's strange that the volume is so big. Every day, you know, they're unwinding, you know, trillion dollars or something like that. And then what happens during that unwinding, collateral gets, in subtle ways, reallocated. So this is also, I have never seen uh, anybody studying this, but I think, or maybe John studies this. I don't know, he's smiling, so that must mean he has a paper on it. Uh, but uh, is there anybody who has written a paper that other people can read? <laughs> I, I modify my question, but we, we can talk about it. But there is, of course, one can write more. We have a model also, and John has a model of collateral, you know, general equilibrium type model of collateral, but I'm saying that the reality of the repo market is one could be interpreted as attempting to make efficient, contingent use of collateral. Because it's like contingent parking, it's like time sharing in parking spaces. You know, rather than have a house sitting on the 30 years in a, in a bank and not being used or it's being used in different ways, you know, uh, like I had when I lived in a small town in Connecticut, my loan was just there for the 16 years that I was there and then, then I paid it off. And I don't think it went anywhere. It was never traded anywhere or something like that. That's like I had a parking space sitting there, you know, empty uh, uh, most of the time or unused. If you, if you go into the market, the market constantly looks for collateral that can be used whenever, wherever it is uh, most efficiently uh, 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 used. Then there is an interesting, there, there's some work by especially Shanti Roll and, and, uh, and Emmanuel Fari where bubbles, price increases in general, of course, absorb some of these parking, you know, it creates parking. When prices go up, that means that there is, uh, there is uh, you know, more room it absorbs some of the money, and bubbles can be seen as potential parking spaces. And then, of course, was created also new kinds of, of instruments, so uh, new, new loan pools. But the, the thing you should have in mind is that there's all the time money pushing in. What is Wall Street trying to do? Wall Street is trying to create parking space for it. And on the other side, very favorably for Wall Street, was the government pushing all the time for ownership by you know, more and more marginal owners. And so it, Wall Street is doing what it's meant to do, which is intermediate between demand and supply, and that was basically what, that's the way to look at it. But it's important to understand that the more that comes in, the more marginal you necessarily have to be. You have to be more creative, and you have to be more marginal. And there's no other way you know, to absorb whatever, five, six trillion dollars of, uh, of foreign money, which was the current account of it. So they, this task is, is huge, and, and it was remarkable. Another note, everything here, all the parking space is debt, which is uh, one of the questions that is not answered by economists. You know, why is it that there's this enormous, I would say, excess demand, in a way, of, of these riskless instruments? I don't want to go, uh, let me not uh, jump forward here, but uh, say just that the original distributed model is, uh, is one where a complex chain, rather than households, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, lending to other households who want to buy houses or something like that, uh, the shadow pricing system, uh, the, the shadow, uh, shadow market, shadow banking market is one where, uh, uh, where the chain is much longer, Money mutual funds, or, or money market mutual funds, and, and uh, various conduits, and, and very importantly, broker dealers here that use the repo markets, and then uh, mortgage-backed securities, and eventually mortgages. Or if you look the other way, mortgages initiated, pulled together to, to mortgage-backed securities. They were purchased by broker dealers, and then they are channeled over to these holders of, of this instrument, the households. The complicated change. And uh, I don't know that anybody has exactly understood why the chain has to be this complicated, but presumably because uh, everybody specialized in, in, in certain of these services. Uh, here is one way of depicting the growth of the shadow banking as just to see the shocking. Nothing, this is relative to, to commercial banking assets, 11,000. And you know, much of nothing happens in, in the, this is relative to household assets, so that's why this looks completely flat. The commercial banking hasn't changed at all, but what is happening here, all the action is in the shadow banking system. And as I said, this is essentially the amount in dollar terms 
that the shadow banking system absorbed during this, this period, or I think I looked at 1985 to 2008, is essentially matched by the current account deficit, the cumulative current account de deficit of the US. So this proposition, at least in the very aggregate, that you know, money came in and was pushed in, and it was absorbed all into the shadow banking system, at least it channeled it, is one that is plausible. So here is the shadow banking system size 2007. I just wanted to flag the fact that the government uh, enterprises, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they are about half of it. It's a huge portion of the story. But uh, the system itself, it eventually grew larger than the actual bank based system, uh, the one that is uh, we call regular banking. A quick, the point is, I just want to say, securitization looks like tranching. I think you most have, you, or all of you have heard tranching. You take a pool of mortgages, you put them in a trust, you split up the trust, you think of the trust as just a company, and then you start tranching it in the sense that you issue securities that are of the highest quality, AAA, all the way down to lower, even lower than triple B, and then there may be even something that's equivalent to equity in the bottom. And the point is that when money comes in from these payments, repayments of payments of interest into the, uh, and principal into this, uh, into this uh, master pool of assets, it gets distributed so that the senior trans, to simplify a lot, so that the senior trans always is paid first and then comes the other transes and it, it's sometimes characterized as a waterfall. And so these are most liable to actually fail. If, 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 that, if that money stops flowing, these will feel it uh, first and, and the AAA uh, feel it last. Uh, there is an assertion, by the way, just to say, considering all the talk about how damaging this is, uh, there is uh, Gary Wharton has studied this, and he's not an entirely independent observer because he, he worked for AIG, but uh, he has studied uh, all AAA tranches that have been issued as, uh, as, uh, in this securitization process and asked, to this day, how many of them have defaulted? And the answer is essentially zero. Now, that's not the same state, oh, so you, it's not correct. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't, yeah, and of course they have been d downgraded. And, and the prices have come down, so it's indicative that they will default. Is that what you wanted to say? Yes, okay. But I just want to say that we are, we are just looking right now, it has not yet defaulted, but the prices have come down in several instances severely. You are exactly right. But I thought this is still a shocking uh, fact that I would have thought that there would have been a lot of defaults by now, but they haven't. Yeah, well, that doesn't matter. Triple A is the, it's the, it's the big chunk that is really of big interest. It doesn't count as a loss because you sell the house. So it takes three years to pull the guy out of the house. I understand. That's, and that's what they are waiting for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a word of alchemy of securitization. I use the al alchemy because uh, Paul Krugman says, what kind of alchemy is this? You take crappy assets, you know, that are, are defaulting with a high probability, and how can you get anything out of it? And I think most of us understand the law of large numbers, but I just wanted to point out still that, you know, for Paul Krugman to write and say that, you know, this is just stupidity, it seems to me fairly stupid. But it's, you know, people say, smart people say stupid things if they are driven very heavily by ideology, and I think it, that is the case in this discussion. But uh, it, this is just a, a, a low large numbers calculation that if you set a thousand independent bonds that have either a payoff of a dollar or, or, or zero, and 10% of each having a 10% chance of paying zero and 90% chance of paying, paying, paying one dollar, you are essentially by the low, lumber, low large number going to get $900 worth of bonds you can transit so that you get $900 worth of bonds that fail less than 1% of the time, meaning they, they get their full repayment uh, back during. So uh, to, to, to say layman, this is a shocking thing to understand. That this is pretty crappy stuff that defaults 10% of the time. And, uh, and this is significantly more secure. So the low large number is enormously powerful. 
And, and when, these, uh, when these assets, securitized assets, were, were, uh, were rated by these various agents, it wasn't that they didn't look at all at correlations. What they didn't uh, realize, and maybe in hindsight that is stupidity, that all the, uh, you know, when things start to really fail, then they are, they are almost 100% correlated or close to it. Uh, I want to say uh, uh, the repo market that we, uh, we, we say is at the center of that picture of, of uh, banking. The repo market is basically, and don't read exactly what the contract looks like, the repo market essentially can be viewed from this perspective of money coming in. The repo market is one giant deposit market. There's a problem when people come with, you know, millions or billions of dollars and tries to park it. They can't park the billions of dollars in the deposit. They, the deposit insurance of the banking system will not cover it. So in the repo market, in, the size of the deals are in the millions. And sometimes in the hundreds of millions or tens of millions. So in order to, how do you protect such an investment from not from such a deposit, how do you create a deposit insurance? The answer is essentially that you are going to back it up by collateral. So uh, unlike uh, uh, this explicit collateral, and in particular the demand for AAA collateral grew very big in, as a way of insuring. Not everything was insured by AAA, but AAA collateral was uh, an important part of the story. And as I said before, the sufficient use of this collateral, state contingent use of the, this collateral, was also a big advantage of this repo market. So in the repo market, there's two advantages, one of which is it has, it emulates a form of deposit insurance for high rollers that have really big money to invest. Because they, that's the way the system works. They, 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 the, the contract says, I sell a security to you, $100, and then at the same time, I agree to buy back the security from, from you for $100 or some, some slight differential, which is the interest rate. And this strange looking, you know, simultaneously buying and then, then uh, repurchasing, uh, I'm sorry, selling and then repurchasing it is effectively like a deposit because I, if it's a daily, say, overnight repo, I can always pull it any, any day. So I, on one, every day I can sort of withdraw my money by simply not rolling it over. So uh, that's the sense in which it's a deposit insurance market. Let me point out, so here you see some of the dynamic uh, of, uh, of uh, what was happening over the time. So here you see the duration or, or you know, uh, the maturity structure of the, the uh, this is the whole financial sector, but a big part of its repos. You can see that the short term contracts became more and more popular as we went on forward in time. And this is why I interpret this as this is one way in which uh, the worst collateral, remember we're going to mar more marginal collateral as we are expanding the system. You can see that uh, the use of the more marginal collateral in order to maintain the AAA rating, one way you can deal with it is actually you make it more short term because the time period is, so, so is not long enough. So, so if the shorter term it is, uh, the sort of less risk it is, and therefore the higher rating it can have, and, uh, and that I think is at least a plausible interpretation of this. Uh, you can also see it on the other side, on the, on, the le on the borrower side, for instance, Bear Stearns, as it got into more trouble, it went into a much more short term, eventually having 25% of its, uh, its borrowing overnight. So this is a, this is a picture that, uh, that uh, fits with the story. So now I want to get to the kind of heart of the story. I put it a little earlier than normal. Where basically, I want to ask, why debt? And so I start with the fact that why is there demand for liquid instruments? Now, I've have a, I have worked with Shanti Roll. Other people have worked uh, on the question of liquidity. Liquidity demand requires some sort of informational imperfection, some sort of friction in the market. Because the obvious question is, why can't I just buy a long, you know, a security with, uh, with say, a 10-year bond or something like that? And if I need money, I just sell, sell the 10-year bond on the market. One answer is that, you know, the market may be less liquid. The uh, other answer is that the bond is certainly more volatile than a shorter term bond. And, uh, and uh, 
and so on. So there are various stories, but the, but the question of liquidity demand is in itself one that requires you know, some modeling. But I'm taking here just as granted that the demand for liquidity came from the fact that the, the Chinese and the other emerging market people had wanted to park the money because they didn't have a parking space in their home country and they didn't want to consume uh, everything as it came in. So these are by nature high velocity markets, meaning that you turn around money, for instance, you take an overnight repo, or the whole say tri-party repo market, which is, uh, uh, which is about half or a little more than half, I think, of the, the repo system. Every day you unwind that whole market for reasons that uh, we may get into. But the point is there is trillion of, over a trillion of dollars that has to you know, be sort of reasserted. And, uh, and this just, you have like an hour and a half or something like that to sort of confirm that you want to still keep rolling over or are you pulling it out. This is not a market where you can sort of say, well, I'm not doing it because I'm not sure about things. Because if you go, if you suddenly say, a few of these players say that you know, I'm not rolling over 100 billion or, 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 or the 10 billion or whatever you, you own. These are frequently in billions, you know, that they own. For instance, to take an example, Lehman eventually on the last day wanted to roll over 5 billion just to get one day further uh, and didn't get the money. Uh, that has cataclysmic consequences usually in these markets. It's the same feature that you see in interbank markets in, uh, in uh, say, any system, like in Finland, which doesn't have a shadow banking system. The, the end comes when one player pulls his money from the table. Because then everybody else sees that, you know, uh, John isn't anymore playing, and therefore nobody else is going to play either, with that particular person like Holmstrom. Okay, so I'm out. You know, once one player pulls out, it's very unlikely that I can make it up with some other player. Uh, depends, of course, on the size and the state of, of where I am and so on, but, uh, but the point is, these are, these are not like stock markets where if you feel uneasy, you can just decide, I'm not going to buy today, or I'm not going to sell today. These, you know, stock markets, by comparison, are contemplative markets. And as a consequence, there's, there's no time for questions. So you see banking in general characterized as basically banking being about trust. As the saying goes, if, the, if a banker has to prove uh, his net worth or you know, his credibility, uh, then he's already lost it. So that saying has a meaning. It's, it's not just you know, that, that somebody came up with a big quip. Every banker will agree that tr these are trust-based markets. Trust-based doesn't mean that I look you in the eye and think, well, are you trustworthy? Trust means that I feel confident enough for the time being that you actually can repay. This is a very important part of the nature, of, of the story about liquidity and the low information character. Because not asking questions is the same statement as saying that it is potential. For the time being, it is opaque. It is an instrument where I don't have to ask questions. So this is why I want to use securities that can be trusted uh, without information acquisition. This is an essential part of, 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 of the story. And for that, debt is the natural instrument because, as it turns out, debt is a, has low volatility. The value changes slowly. It's, so the better the underlying, the, uh, uh, the, the lower the volatility of the underlying a a asset is, the better, the slower is, of course, the security that is written on top of it. And also, what we'll, what's, uh, is going to happen is that, uh, and by the way, that's why housing is so central here, is because housing is a slow-moving asset, uh, or price is slow-moving. Securitization is important here because it enhances the the, the, move, the movement slows through diversification, it slows down. But there's also the fact, the second fact, which is that it means that these are instruments, debt is an instrument that doesn't trigger information acquisition. So let me explain this. This is, a, this is in red because it's important. Everybody would agree that symmetric information about the payoff of an instrument is essentially the same as saying that it's liquid. In order for something to be liquid, it must mean that we are, we are 
having roughly the same instruments or perhaps precisely the same info, we understand the value the same way, in these markets at least. From that, people jump to the conclusion that symmetric information is achieved by bringing all the information on the table. The logic symmetric, we have all in agreement. As a consequence of that, people draw the conclusion that means every, every, all the information needs to be on the table. When in fact, transparency, more information very often creates asymmetric information. So if we, you and I are purchasing a car, I'm, purchasing, I'm contemplating to purchase a car and I, my competitor is a mechanic, uh, it's very bad news for me. I, can, I may compete with this person from a distance, if you can see the car only from a distance like me and see sort of rough gross figures, but if he can go and see, you know, check the manual and, you know, try it out a little bit, I can do the same, you know, so it's transparent, it's just as that weird. But the point is, he has a totally, a much more informed model for processing the information. And so, Transparency in this, this is a naive argument to think that transparency will improve the, uh, you know, be a step towards symmetry. Of course, if we dump all the information in the world onto the table, which means, you know, everything John has ever experienced, everything Eric has experienced, everything Bank has experienced, all of that has to be on the table so that now and then there's a piece of info and then we have to process all of that. Then, yes, transparency, full transparency will certainly give us symmetric information. But barring those extreme circumstances, transparency, on, only transparency on things with which we process the same way, that kind of transparency is okay and good but transparency on issues that we might actually process very differently is certainly not a very uh, a good way. So it has the paradoxical implication that it often is much easier to achieve symmetric information by nobody knowing anything. That is rather than everybody seeing everything. So I'm giving you some examples here just to say, see that uh, actually Symmetric information is easier to achieve through ignorance. So De Beers, I use the De Beers example, which I've taken from Milgram and Roberts' book. Uh, De Beers, when it sells wholesale diamonds, it puts the diamonds in a bag, literally. Closes the bag, and then it puts all the bags on the table, and the bags will say, triple, here are triple A, meaning, you know, of certain quality of wholesale. Here are, you know, two, double A, and so on. It has labels about quality. The Beers has put the labels on the quality. Buyers cannot open the bags. And the argument Milgram and Roberts gives, and, and the one that I think is plausible and is used here as well, of course, one reason is if they started to open the bags, that would take some time. So, you know, it would slow down the trading process. But more importantly, perhaps, if at the end of the day, or, you know, in the process of looking at these bags, you worry that somebody is more qualified at looking at bags than you are looking and so on, you would get into this asymmetric situation. You know, I know that, you know, uh, Eric is a specialist on diamonds. He goes and looks at the bags and then he walks away with this bag. I know that one good bag just disappeared. And so the quality of the remaining bags is a little lower. So you understand that this transparency in this context is clearly a bad thing for liquidity and for maintaining symmetric information. Car auctions, as it happens, and it has, uh, Genosub has written a paper, these are ones where you get just a very short period to see, look at the car, and then it's traded. One reason is, of course, these are, these are used cars, so they are supposed to churn fast. But another reason is, most likely, also the fact that if people could really start driving, there are very strict rules. You cannot start the car, or is it, you know, you can't drive the car, or they, you can't look under the hood, and various conditions that say you can't explore it too much. It, that's not about speed as much as it is about indicative that there is an adverse selection is at issue. Course bond ratings, of course, is a perfect example. Why so course? Well, this argument would say it's good to have cost bond ratings because if you try to make it very fine, you know, that would potentially lead to, you know, different understandings of what these ratings mean and so forth. The coarser they are, the more there is commonality in understanding about what these, th these things mean. 
Securitization itself, I, I'm not saying this is the reason, but it is a way of creating actually opacity because you put these things in a bag that prevents, we saw actually an example of that in, in class last time when we, we put. So uh, it's not just a risk, it's not necessarily just a matter of diversification, it's also about obfuscation to make it harder for people to see. Clearing houses in the, I told you about all the crisis that pre, you know, went before the uh, Great Depression during the national banking era and so on. The clearing houses, when, they, when the bank got into trouble, they rounded themselves out, put themselves out, so to, figuratively speaking, into a bag and didn't give out any information anymore about the individual banks. And then they issued claims on the whole bag. So this is a little hint to today's people who think that the solution is to actually open the bags and become more transparent. The clearing houses as private enterprises trying to solve uh, problems had a, just the opposite approach, which is put things in a bag and deal with it internally. So uh, that's an example. And of course the ultimate example, money. The absolutely most opaque instrument you can ever think about. It happens also to be the most liquid. You have no clue what is behind, you know, 10 shekels, or certainly I don't have a clue. <laughs> but, you know, there's some faith of the government or something like that. What, what does it mean? I mean, with the, especially the way the U.S. is spending right now, we are starting to get nervous. So these are some of the examples. Let me just come to this figure that, uh, because John is here, uh, he loves this figure. There, there's an other, there's a, I'm emphasizing here the fact that debt is optimal, or debt is a desirable instrument. Not just because its volatility is low, uh, but because relative to, you know, some other instruments, but also because when debt is well into the money that is collateral value is well out here in the right hand side, then the value is up here. A person who buys a debt instrument doesn't really care even if I know more about my value. Do I know that my house is a million or 900,000? That has very little meaning if we are talking about mortgage that is of the size of $100,000. So it's not just that, uh, it's that the debt, the buyer of debt or the holder of debt is just not interested in collateral values that are far out, exact values of collateral that are far out. It's a much coarser information set, which is, is it, how likely is it that it, it will repay itself? And uh, this picture is of importance here is, by the way, the debt value as an option, so they, if, if there's some tier period to run, but this picture is important is, uh, in, in the next, next part when I'm going to talk about the fact that one of the unpleasant features of debt is that while it's very information insensitive here, it actually is rapidly at the curve, and depending on, on the length of, of, of the contract, you know, if it's just an overnight repo, then this, this value line or debt is basically hugging the red line exactly as a function of collateral, it becomes information sensitive. So this is part of the clue of you can think, by the way, this could be a debt contract, but it also applies to any leverage institution. So you, if, if, you, if you think about bankruptcy versus non-bankruptcy of some institution that has issued a lot of, a lot of debt, then what this says is that uh, people will be very disinterested in information about that institution, about information about the ABS contract, until something brings them to start to worry that actually the value is somewhere close to the corner. And this discontinuity, this, this sort of, it's almost like here is a state where nobody really asks any questions. So the people ask, why didn't they ask any questions? The answer here is because we wrote the debt contract so that the collateral is well, we are somewhere out here. And there's nothing, whatever we learn here, it doesn't matter for the value because the value is hugging exactly the red line. So there's zero reason to ask questions when it's out there. And it also explains why they now are all talking about transparency, because they happen to end up in the, along this line. Here you are extreme, this is like equity. And every dollar matters for, you know, what is the value. 
And so you have this discontinuity. So I think what I'm trying to say is that this picture of thinking about not that this is in the money and this is default and that's it. It gets enhanced, the thinking, when you think about this is information insensitive and this is information sensitive because there's going to be an endogenous change in the way people are going to collect and look at information when you go from this state over to this state. So this is an important figure, and, I, and you can see also that you know, if we change maturities and riskiness and so on, we have option values that can price this, option, this, uh, this uh, debt security and see what affects. But in particular, you create more liquidity with the short-term security because the, the shorter the maturity is, the closer this line will go. So the, this insensitive region will expand closer to the corner. The unfortunate consequence of that is that the more you push it into the corner, the more liquidity you push here, the steeper or more dramatic will be the switch into the, insens to the sensitive region. You are basically pushing everything into the tail risk. And uh, that is also, I think, an important aspect of why debt always is involved in financial crisis. Because you, it's, it's for two reasons. One is that nothing happens in good times, and then there's a fairly sudden you know, turn, turnaround in bad times. So I'm using this as a trigger. There are other reasons also. But the second reason is also, as I said, the collection of information that I, I, I don't think about that state at all. I'm just going on trust, and then the game completely changes around. So there are papers nowadays where people write it basically as a zero probability event of default and thinking about this as basically saying a zero probability event has happened. But I don't like that view of you know, making zero. You can do a lot of economic modeling if you allow yourself zero probabilities becoming positive probabilities. This is a way of endogenizing it and getting very close to that feature. So uh, uh, this, this picture in my view is really uh, worth thinking about or keeping in mind. So uh, this is a summary saying it's all good for the reasons of it's, uh, relying on debt, securitization, course ratings, and so on. This all makes sense, quite, quite contrary to what the common wisdom is. That's what you at least should be getting at this point. That there's a very compelling case to actually create instruments that have been, in order to be liquid, that have made information sensitive, and that is the reason people didn't have much information at all about what was going on, because that was the very purpose of these instruments. This is a radical thought to at least regulate us, and uh, tell Bob Oman about it also, because he thought transparency is so important for everything. This is an example where it's not so good. But as I said, it has problems because it pushes things into the uh, tail, and it hides systemic risk. So here is the deep paradox. When we create a system like that and we get suddenly close to the, to, to the barrier, then we have a real problem about not having produced any information for a long time. So think about it something like, you know, if you, if you look at the timeline like this and you say, you, you look at the value of collateral, say, as, as you know, some stochastic process like this, as long as it's above this line, you will just know that it is above its line. That's all the information you get from a debt contract. People pay their, their payments. You, you have no clue about the, or unless you investigate, of course, but you have no clue. You are, you are relying on this. The one time when it suddenly put, goes through the barrier and can, goes into default in the sense that the person doesn't do, that's a huge discontinuity in information unless you have been following some information along the way, but you, according to this thesis, you haven't. So if you set up a, a, a contract that has this feature, you, you have this potential problem. You see it in ratings, of course. In these ratings of the products, you know, they were all triple A, triple A, triple A. Suddenly, you know, the, the crisis came around and a catastrophic re-rating. You know, there's down, ma massive downgrades, you know, everybody doing. Possibly, in my view, one of the reasons the crisis gets so deep because they over-downgraded these instruments. History may prove still a poss the possibility that the big error wasn't the AAA ratings. The big error was becoming a, going into a panic as a rating agent and downgrading so much these instruments that you know it had big effects on, on fire sales and such. That's a I'm just throwing it as a, as a radical thought about the possibility. 
So Steve Ross, for instance, asserts that the ratings should actually be ones. They shouldn't just give the probability of default. They should also start to talk about the probability of downgrading because it affects who can hold these instruments and therefore affects the price of the instruments. Now, banks, uh, let me just point out that this tail risk, uh, I, one might think that this tail risk is some sort of big flaw in the system. That the, you know, how did the banks end up actually holding the tail risk? In information economics, this is not a flaw, it's the natural way things are. That is, that we saw it in the class, you know, for those who have been in the class, you saw the basic idea, you sell debt and you hold on to the equity yourself. So banks, in part at least, they were basically underwriting uh, certain or, or gave, gave backstops. So they were effectively holding on to the risky part because that's the way at least economic logic would suggest they should. Now it's a different matter that from a system risk point of view that's really bad and they may have to be forced to you know, unload some of that, that risk to, to the extent it affects the system. But to say that they were stupid or you know, naive or didn't think about it when they had learned it, it's, it's certainly, this is perfectly consistent with economic theory. So you, you hear the theme all the time that there's a rational, there's at least a potential rational story for most of this. Here you see that 66% was in this highly leveraged sector, uh, mainly commercial banks here. So tail risk was completely in the hands of the banking system. And this was, of course, a big part of how the crisis went out of the subprime into the larger system. And uh, that's something that needs to be, you know, to get this corrected requires, you know, a lot. For instance, it may mean that the shadow banking system cannot operate the way they does, or securitization cannot operate. Somebody has to put in much more information or, or you know, study these uh, products much more carefully if uh, that's going to happen. So as I, this is just a rehearsal. They didn't ask questions. We understand that the used mechanical Lee formula fits perfectly the idea that the important thing is not that we have it exactly right. The important thing is that Eric is thinking the same way as I am. You know, I don't want to, if suddenly he comes with a masking formula, which I know, of course, is much better than the Lee formula, that would make me incredibly nervous because now he has more information than I have. I'm using this general stupid Lee formula. So any, you should, you should think about these AAA assets as private money in this shadow banking system. And it's using a different formula. It's like creating a different kind of money. And, uh, and that's not good for liquidity. That's not good for money creation. Uh, let me just say, in reference to this picture, for instance, the money market funds promise to not break the bank. They promise you a dollar back if you invest a dollar. That's the, the, uh, simple, if we say it simply, that's known as breaking the buck when they are unable to pay you back the dollar. But unlike the bank, this is, not, this is just a loose promise. They don't have to you know, obey, obey it. It's just like a dividend promise. It's stronger than a dividend promise. But this has the same feature that if you have a system where they always promise to pay you back at least a dollar, they pay interest and other things as well, then that is actually a, 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 no, a worrisome, a potentially at least worrisome uh, uh, for the fact that it can lead to contagion. So when you saw the reserve fund suddenly break the buck, meaning it went through this, that was a big shock to the system. And it came, of course, at a very inopportune time with Lehman just having fall, uh, fallen. So you can, this kind of thinking about people not collecting money or no information is leaking, this breaking the buck uh, and contagion following out of it is, an, is a natural uh, consequence. And that, by the way, explains, let me just say, it's an entirely different product. If you have a product, a money market mutual fund that promises one dollar and sticks to it as long as it can, that's a totally different instrument from something that moves around a little bit and sometimes you get 99 cents, sometimes you get a 101. And this is just a totally different category of animal. Because now you are going to get interested, you know, you may not be interested in cents, but multiply that by a billion, you know, you get more interested in the number. Uh, so, do you see, these are very different instruments, and that's why the industry 
highly dislike the idea of making it continuously mark to market. It's it's uh, it's mark to market every you know I think every half year or or, or uh, maybe John knows what they have been doing now. But they actually mark to market, but periodically, and they are allowed to be within half a percentage point from the from the value. So uh, this just shows you how important this information sensitivity is. Uh, another implication is that government information may be ignored. So it may be that the government puts out and makes it more transparent, the system. But because people are, it's just like saying that the government will tell everybody what my house is worth. You know, 900,000, 950,000, or Zillow does that for me. But it doesn't matter for the guy who has 100,000. He doesn't go and look at the Zillow of what Holmes's house is. He's not even nervous that, you know, he's getting anywhere close to, to, to you know, his 100,000. So do you see that it's not, when you think about making it transparent, it doesn't hurt necessarily. That's one thing to understand from this comment. But it doesn't help necessarily either for the people's relevance, but it may help for the system, of course, to learn where we are going. So this is one of the reasons I think government should be involved in actually creating transparency. Here is a shocking thing, but it relates to this, uh, this uh, idea of, uh, of uh, clearing houses. One way to deal with the crisis, instead of shouting, let's just open up all those bags. You remember how they had these ideas that they would auction off all these assets so that we would know the value of all these assets. History suggests that it's exactly the reverse process that is the solution to the problem. You put the bad stuff into a bag, close it up, you put a little bit of extra money on top of it as an enhancement, and then you close the bag. And that is actually going to make the bag, and then you start selling transits. And, and now that is going to be much more liquid immediately, rather than trying to you know, tell the whole world what each of these individual assets were. By the way, these ABS instruments, quite contrary to what people think, they were books. Anybody could have gone and read the book to see exactly what was in the bag. But they, it was like 100 pages or something like that. What was the st st standard size, John? 100 pages for ABS, you know, describing all the instruments? More than 100, OK. So pretty, but you could do it. It's not that you couldn't do it. Uh, but uh, maybe it was made uh, complicated exactly for the reasons I'm suggesting. Let me say a few words. How long? It, it ends at 5.30. Is that OK, so I just want to say one of the things that I think is really interesting to ask, why did this lead to a panic? And so I feel confident about the first part of the story, about you know, why it was that nobody asked questions and some of the problems. The question is, what caused the panic? And let me point out, one of the striking features is there was a lot of information about something bad coming. You can see that the only signs on housing, you know, look at this bubble, this is what Bob Schiller showed uh, in actually in June 2007. He showed this picture and it had just, it had just turned and he forecasted that there was big trouble coming. And when he was asked how big, he said, I think it's going to drop 30%. And people said, why 30%? Because when you draw this line straight here, we are going to come back. That's his sophisticated, you know, econometrics. <laughs> and I tell you, he, he's, for the second, he's for the second time very close to the truth unless the houses really start dropping still further. So uh, I would say, look at what derivative is constant. In the P ratio, it's, it's, the, it's, uh, it's constant, the P ratio. Here, it's the first derivative is roughly constant. And if it deviates a lot from it, predict that it will come back. And, that's a, that's a, and then you practice uh, your, 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 uh, your skills in, 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 in being interviewed by Bloomberg or something like that. And then you, then you are in business. Uh, subprime spread, huge indication starting 2007, you know, the crisis really started in August 2007. Tons of information suggesting that tr trouble was looming. Uh, haircuts, I mean, these are, these are very much questioned by a lot of people, Gordon, but uh, I think this is a rough idea. A, uh, John has a table with Ellington haircuts, and, and they, are, they are not unlike this, I assume, or... or they are roughly in line. So haircuts means that I lend less and less money against the same value of security. You, have, you come with a $100 security, when the haircut is 100%, I don't take it at all. 80%, I give you 20% of it. I take the $100 security and give you $20 as a loan. So haircuts, you know, indicating trouble. Here you see 
how on average, this is Gorton again drawing a picture of average increase in the, in the spread of, of these ABX indexes. Never mind, a, ABX index is basically a, a valuation of this, uh, a market valuation of these uh, products, these ABX, ABS products. The thing that, this is a scary picture. I used to, I, I should have perhaps put it. It's a scary picture because you get all this information of impaired assets. And not much happened to the liars here, which is measures, you know, basically as a market assessment of systemic risk. That is, what is the interbank market saying about the risk in the banking system? And not, I mean, something happens after 2007, but not much between that and then the eventual 2008. And then when Lehman goes, it just shoots up. It has, by the way, come down significantly since then. But this is a scary picture because it shows that even when you have the information, you know, on the table, there's a lot of information. Still people miss a panic like this. So this speaks in that sense, again, another way of speaking against transparency. Maybe the, it's not going to be as effective to be transparent. Uh, as a government, you know, you may need some more measures, you know, maybe ones that put some lid on, uh, on, the, on the leverage or something like that. These are just pictures I go through. Let me just show that uh, people have said that uh, uh, Gordon has, has put forward the notion that there was a run on the repo. And people uh, said that, well, repo markets actually, when you look at the repo market, there, there, isn't, there isn't enough of repo to make a run of it. But actually here, uh, here you see a picture where if you look at Lehman, it is exactly its repo funding that really dropped. I mean, maybe other funding as well, but look at this, 200 billion, and what is this, a week, a little more than a week? You know, going from 200 or 150 billion, you know, suddenly, 150 billion down to zero in one week. So I th this means that their collateral, and what so, here is a big paradox to explain. They had treasuries to put up as collateral, but people wouldn't even take the treasuries. And the plausible reason why they wouldn't take treasuries as collateral wasn't that they were suspicious about the value of the treasuries. They were suspicious, they weren't sure how this legal, will play itself out legally, this thing, if Lehman collapses. Maybe government comes involved, you know, some strange payments, you know, God knows. I think John has his own set of problems at Ellington. The repo market has legal uncertainty. That's one thing that we learned. And, uh, and uh, historically, that has been also the case. So that, that's probably why they didn't even take, uh, but once you get near bankruptcy, they won't even take your treasury bonds. Because uh, the fear is that it's brought into the bankruptcy proceedings, and it's not bankruptcy remote so that you can sell it. You have to actually wait till all the assets have been sorted out, and that's the uncertainty. Here you see, I just want to show, here you see the home equity loan. That's the biggest chunk of the ABS market. The home equity loan is, is, is this, how much is it, then you have other loans, you have various residential mortgages and so on. But home equity was really, this is actually, I don't know, I'm not confident about the word subprime here, but, uh, but that's, the, that's how it's said in Adrian and Sin, but it seems to me odd that the subprime would be that big. I don't think it ever was that big. Uh, so why sudden collapse? And uh, one story is the one I'm telling here that you're going from a state of ignorance into a sudden state of shock. That it isn't, you know, something was not the way you had imagined. It's like an earthquake. And that can create contagions. It can create fire sales. There's another state, the global gains literature, for instance, for those who know it, it, this fits pretty well with the idea that you see and see and see things, but you don't act until suddenly you hit a, you, you know, you reach a threshold, and then we switch to another equilibrium. Uh, I haven't seen that formally modeled, but it's possible. And, uh, but the two key, I would say, contenders are, something some, there was an information switch that really changed valuations or created confusion in the case of night and uncertainty. That's one of the class of explanations for the, for the, the other one is saying that uh, we ended up, with, and you can end up with fire sales for that. The other class of explanations is that fire sales uh, kicked in because either through adverse selection, which is the one I mentioned, but either because the buyer side was very thin. 
There are also nowadays models where it's the seller side that is very thin. But whatever it is, fire sales is another line of modeling or line of explanation. And then, of course, we have the, de the whole deleveraging story. This is about what gets the deleveraging started. And then the deleveraging kicks in, and then, you know, uh, that's sort of the second phase of the crisis. So this is the initiator of the... Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to just go back. So I'm at the end. Let me say the lessons. One of this is, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have debt. That's important to understand. In the, in the Arrow, the Brew type of capital asset pricing model, you know, debt doesn't play any role. We all have a slice of whatever securities there are. So the, it's, it's like we have one giant securitized market and we are just, you know, take, what are you shaking your head? The capital asset pricing model versus stock and debt. Yeah, but we hold equal shares in. We have, They, they hold all proportions in the, in the, in the efficient, efficient portfolio. Okay, so I said something wrong. There's a new sh shocking theory being presented here. I, I have lived, you see, this is how I lived in ignorance. I relied on, you know, I, 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 I take it back. But, uh, but if, let's go this way, they, they would be, why is there debt in the, why is there debt in the capital asset pricing model? I mean, somebody then holds only riskless assets. Okay, let's not leave, let me, uh, but in, in any case, let me just, this at least is true. If we all held, if we all held equal shares in all the, all the, uh, uh, all the assets that are in the U.S., then there would never be a crisis. Then we have, so liquidity demand, which is poorly explained partly today still, we have this, uh, it's met with this riskless debt. The point I tried to spend some time on is it creates a vacuum of information. So in the, the cost side of this sort of, it's very liquid, is that people will not collect information naturally in that state. And so systemic risk and such things may be. And uh, the last thing is, uh, is uh, observation. The lesson is that global imbalances create a challenge because to the extent at least it becomes wholesale, it goes through the channel of wholesale funding, they, we learned in this crisis that there is not a deposit insurance substitute such as you know, the repo market to actually insure people. Finally, let me finish up with just one picture, which is bank leverage is 40 to 1990. The reason is because I do believe, if I, I'm just picking one action that I think is, I fi find most important in the regulation of the system that I know right now. And that is actually less transparency. It's not about transparency, but it is about higher capital requirements. And uh, this relates to the leverage cycle that John was commenting on in, uh, in so enthusiastically on during lunch. Uh, but before one does that, take note, this is the bank leverage. This doesn't include the shadow banking system. This is the bank leverage. In 1940 something, it was down to, what is it? 7% perhaps or something. It's basically stayed flat since. In fact, the leverage went up here, and I don't know what happened in 2000, and, and, and it would be interesting. It's taken from an article that was published in the early 90s. But notice how many years again have gone. You know, we are talking about 45 years with basically very low leverage. So anybody who says the leverage was too high, you know, 5% is too little, 6% is too little, they have to contend with this. How did it work so well this long like this? And it wasn't like this, by the way, pre preventive financial crisis either. You know, the high leverage. So you have, you have a whole data set saying that leverage uh, didn't used to be at least the solution. 
My feeling is that it still is the right solution because, uh, without explaining it further, it substitutes private insurance for government insurance, which I think is excessive, but uh, also because wholesale funding, I believe, is going to be a cost. That is my reason why I'm looking at this and saying yes, but that was in a world where there was no wholesale funding, you know, of the size that we are talking about. And that therefore it's prudent. I didn't sign this, you know, famous economist letter demanding it to go to 15% because I didn't like the arguments they made. Because it was all, everything was good about leverage and nothing was good about lower leverage. But a, a reasonable statement is still to say in this very limited knowledge about what's going on, it's at least prudent to raise the leverage to you know, require more equity uh, than the 5 6% that you see in this figure. So that's my one. So I, I sign on to the conclusion of that, uh, that uh, theme that was presented, or that letter that was presented. Thank you.